Hello, I'm John Croman, and we're here in the middle of the Greatest Generation exhibit at the Minnesota History Center, and I'm surrounded by some very amazing people, great civic leaders, and today we're going to talk about how the spirit of that generation can translate to what we're doing now in society. And first, just talk about the Great Generation. As Nina and others have pointed out, they lived through this horrifying depression and then transcended into another war, to a huge war. And how did that affect the kind of people they were? What does that say about the kind of people they were that they could do all of this? I could jump in and say that it seems to me that this generation was really profoundly sh shaped by their early years during the Depression. Um, they pulled together during the Depression. They ha people had to help each other. Uh, the war came and it was an enormous challenge. Um, it meant that uh, people had to pull together around something when they didn't know the outcome. It's so easy for us to forget that they didn't know that they could live under Hitler or live under Hirohito. And then I think it was only natural that those bonds of friendship and the bonds of common purpose would carry them forward um, as they moved into their, the next phase of their lives. That's a good point because we watched the old war movies and we know that the U.S. is going to win in the end, but they didn't at the yeah. time. Sean? Well, I, I think one of the things that it, that experience must have given them was a sense of perspective about how, how things um, can be, sort of what their imagination, what their dream for the country is as well as the consequences of not doing something. So I, I think they had this, not just this uh, unifying experience coming out of the Depression, but to see two such extreme um, potential outcomes in the world around them and to fight so hard to get to, for democracy and for these um, these good outcomes gave them a worldview when they got home that they put, put to work. Mr. Secretary. Well, I think the interruption of the war, one of the ways that that affected everything was people's anxiousness when they got home to get on with life, to get in school and get out, to get to work, to build a career, to build a home. I mean, it's kind of an explosion of education and of construction of company creation. So I also think there was a way in which that uh, kind of pause and interruption in what people's dreams were then translated into kind of a hyperdrive which then built us basically the society that we enjoy today. Yeah, well, they, first they were interrupted by the Depression and then really interrupted by the war. Yes, they were children in the Depression, and so they kind of watched it perhaps from an observation point of view, but they had their own dreams, and as they began, particularly with the, the massive intervention of the government, the, the sort of Roosevelt programs and all of that, they could see a future coming, then the war, and everything they were thinking about, everything they hoped for just had to be put on hold families and children and careers. But boy, when they got home, the universities exploded, the housing, all the things that were temporary housing became semi-permanent, and people built companies because the war also brought a lot of technological innovation and sort of change that then people knew how to build upon. And frankly, much of the rest of the world was destroyed. The United States industrial base was basically intact, and so we had an opportunity that I think we uh, were very responsible about in terms of being the sort of backbone for much of the rebuild in Europe and in Asia, we helped, in addition to our own growth and kind of going back to our dreams, we helped other people put their lives back together as well. And that's an important part of the American value, American ethic culture. Very good. I think there was also a, um, a much more unified common story that was coming out of that era as well. Um, the uh, story of the Depression, the story of, the, of, of World War II, was so overpowering, so uh, enveloping, that it really crowded out a lot of other um, diverse uh, narratives out there. So when the war ended, um, there was a lot of common energy, uh, very focused. You know? um, there, there was tremendous forward movement, but unlike today, um, it wasn't greatly dispersed. There was kind of a, a common narrative that you were going to achieve this, and this was the American dream. I think that's one of our challenges today, is uh, uh, dealing with um, the diversity of stories out there, the, the diversity of purpose out there. And the question isn't so much do we move forward or not, it's just that there are many ways of doing that these days. Back then, um, it was a little bit more constrained. Now, Keisha, you're a I was going to say we're all baby boomers. I'm not sure if you're even in that category or not. I, I don't think so, no. <laughs> um, I think when I think about uh, this generation, I think the thing that comes to mind the most for me is people really feeling as individuals they had a part in what the country was becoming and what it was to become. Um, and I think we lost some of that 
um, over time in some of the later wars. Like I said, my war was the first Gulf War. So it was a very different model and a very different idea, and there wasn't that threat of, uh, to the homeland, and it was a very different kind of idea. I think we're moving towards a time, and maybe it is because of the current economic crisis, where people are starting to see again their own personal role in how this country is going to fare, um, and a personal role in choices and decisions that means we're all going to become successful, and I think that's coming back around again. Yeah, the, the Gulf War was one of the first spectator wars, yes. as opposed to Vietnam and obviously World War II in Korea, where where people were involved, and, and on the home, especially World War II, there was a home front, which I'm sure this exhibit uh, addresses, but that's one of those interesting interesting phenomenons of warfare in this country, and, and Keisha talking about the Gulf War compared to World War II, that comes to mind. Um, anything, anybody else want to add on this particular question? John, I, I would like to jump in on that, because I think um, spectator is a really interesting uh, concept there. And, it, and um, it was one of the effects of that era that um, you were uh, a participant in your, in your community during the Depression because everyone had to band together and we had a government response to it. And then of course with the war, there was this group mentality. Th that generation were not spectators, they were mm -hmm. actors. But a lot of the generations uh, that came after were spectators. Some of that was through technology through te television, for instance. But it also is one of the um, effects, I would argue, of some of the New Deal policies, that it actually created a, a spectator citizenry as well. Um, and some of that was filled in by other social groups, whether it was Rotary or Qantas and stuff like that. But that's one of our opportunities right now, is to stop being spectators and start being actors. Uh, a citizen is someone who is active on behalf of the common good. They don't spectate that. Right. Even if you don't want to read the headlines about the, what's happening in Europe or the Pacific, the fact that you can't get new tires, right. for instance, that you know something's going, or you're saving your, your tin foil. Totally involved. Yeah. I think there are also some lessons to be learned here, and the whole question about diversity, I think, is one. Um, this is a nation that pulled together. We see as we look at this exhibit and read about this generation being challenged economically, being challenged by the war. Um, but you have to understand that this generation, many of those people were immigrants or they were the children of immigrants. And yet today we seem to forget that we are the children of immigrants and that we are that our strength is in being a diverse nation. And so um, as we are individualistic, as we apparently, and I use the word in quotes, struggle with immigration, when in fact what we ought to be doing is embracing immigration. Because if we learn from history, we know that immigration has been our strength. And it's this generation, which is uh, a nation made of immigrants, uh, that really makes this history that we all look to and learn from. And it's the motto of our nation, out of many, one. one. True. Sean. Well, I, I want to pick up from something that Nate said. I mean, the, there's, a, there's a lot of talk in the context of this exhibit about um, how that generation was a generation of joiners, that they joined these civic organizations. but. Um, from my perspective at the Citizens League, and I think she might feel the same way, that I think they were a generation of builders. I mean, they came back and were not passive, and they built things. They built organizations, they built companies, they built um, nonprofits, so that they built these great organizations that people could then join. So it was, it was, a, um, it was not a passive or consumer view of citizen, citizenry. They were, they were there to participate and to build, and that metaphor, I think, is fitting for the time we're in right now. We need builders again. Because the generation, frankly, in between ours and theirs, I think, tore a lot of things down. And a lot of those had to be torn down. And now we're in a time where we have to build up again. Yeah, I think that's fairly true. And when we think about organizations like the League of Women Voters, which actually started in Minnesota in 1919, and built the organization, and you saw it like another big wave of participation um, during this time, or during the time we're talking about here. and. You know, and again, we're seeing that happen again. We saw some dips in the 80s and the 90s, but again, we're seeing people really wanting to engage and really wanting to be part of the decisions and the creation of the country they want to be a part of. Um, there isn't that same, there isn't the same level of segregation 
and some of the issues that really did exist, you know, in the 40s and the 50s. Um, so I'm setting the stage for the changes of the 60s. And so now here we are having had all that, and we're facing another crisis. And how do we take the diversity of the new immigrants? How do we take the diversity of really not having a separate society? I mean, I think one of the things that was easy to say we're all on the same path, when you look around this exhibit, most of it's white, right? It was easy to be all on the same path. Now that's not really the situation anymore. We really are, have become an integrated, diverse culture. And how does that change how we think about citizenry? And how does that change how we think about engaged citizenship? And I think that's a really big part of what we're here to talk about. Very good. I think that wraps up our first segment. <laughs>